episode of Outside the Rack is brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of the Gym Aware. In today's world of strength and conditioning, data collections become the utmost of importance, and that's exactly where Gym Aware separates itself from the competition. Because when we're sitting there and looking to collect data, what data are you actually collecting? And are the numbers you're looking at fitting into the exercises that you're utilizing? And even more so, are they going to answer the questions that you're looking for? Looking at different ways that you are moving the barbell through peak and mean, both velocity and power, is really what separates gym aware from the competition. Being able to understand what your ballistic exercises are doing separate to what your strength exercises are doing really allows you to program at a much more specific level for your athletes. So hop on over to kinetic.com.au to see what Evan and his team have in store for you today. The world of strength and conditioning is filled with some fantastic practitioners that are always searching for more. But more what? What are strength and conditioning coaches searching for to better their ability to prepare their athletes? Well, what about cutting edge information or a place where you can find different opinions from forward thinking coaches on what you're doing, how you're doing, and try to get feedback to be better for your athletes? Or what about a place where you'll find like-minded coaches that can provide solid coaching advice and career development for you as you progress through your career as a strength and conditioning professional? Well, this is exactly why we built the Strength Coach Network. You'll have access to exclusive monthly content on top of the sensationally active forum that we have where you can communicate with coaches all over the world to find those answers that you're looking for to help you be a better practitioner for your athletes. So make sure you hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash cvasps, that's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash c-v-a-s-p-s, and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the 16th episode of Outside of the Rack, brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of Gym Aware. In this show, we are going to try to dive a little deeper into the minds of some of the top practitioners in the world of sport performance to try to learn a little bit more about who they actually are and how they got to where they are today. Today, we are joined by the general manager of Union Fitness in Pittsburgh, Todd Hammer. Ham, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, brother. It's always awesome to talk to you. Yeah, man. Well, listen, before we get rock and rolling too much here, who is Todd Hammer? Who is Todd Hammer? You know, I love that question because I think it's such an important question for us to ask ourselves and our athletes to ask themselves. Um, Yeah, who's Todd Hammer? First and foremost, um, first off, I'm a father. I have a son, Tenzig, and that's the most important thing in my life. And it's why I'm out of collegiate strength and conditioning right now, because I didn't know if it was possible to, and I'm not judging anyone, but I didn't know if it was possible to be a good father and be a good strength coach at the same time. So Todd Hammer is a, a wannabe renaissance man. I want to be able to play my drums whenever I want, play guitar when I want, mountain bike when I want, still be a good coach, still train people, still uh, still help make, make people better, and try to improve the world. Um, during this process, I was asked you know, what my 5, 10, 20-year plan is, and I said 20-year plan is pretty simple, to retire. Uh, in 20 years, I want to be retired, um, and not that I don't want to do anything, but um, I want to have some fun, kick some ass, make people better, and then be able in 20 years to decide what I want to do. So I think, uh, like I said, want to be renaissance man is the best way I can describe myself. I want to be able to do everything. And um, I just, I don't know if collegiate and strength conditioning um, professionally is is the right spot for a person that wants to do everything. I think that's a fair assessment. I think that that's a, a fair statement to be, you are a 21st century renaissance man. You, you more so before you cut your hair, but um, definitely... Sure. A 21st century renaissance man is, is a good description of ham. So then listen, buddy, let's get to the, let's get to the first one then. Let, yeah, let's let's hear it. Todd share with us a learning experience that brought about an epiphany in your career. Uh, you know, I'm going to use my last one. I really enjoyed my last job. You know, we were in the same conference. I was at uh, George Washington, the George Washington University. They're big on the D. Um, and I really, I think there's good leadership. Uh, the, the athletic director, awesome, awesome lady, Tanya Vogel, um, really enjoyed working for her. But basically after taking that job, I had an epiphany and I thought, what's the end game here? I always go back to the 80, 20 rule. 
and say, you know, I put 80% of your time in and 20% of your product or whatever. And there's a million ways you can kind of tweak that role to your job. But I was looking at my job and I was thinking, what do I want to do? And last year I had an epiphany and I thought, I'm, I, I don't want to be the head strength coach at Penn State, at Maryland, at Pitt, at West Virginia, at USC. Um, I just want to be, you know, help people get better and improve. And so what I learned last year is that there's so many different ways to do it. And I think often in strength and conditioning, uh, people get this, this uh, solipsist, my favorite word, solipsistic, because it's this narrow minded view that I think we often get as strength coach. And I say we as a guy who did it for 20 years. And we can't see outside of how else we can improve people. Um, so last year, I, I, I basically had an epiphany and said, I, I want to be a strength coach, but I just don't know if I'm you know, willing to do what it takes to be a strength coach anymore. And I ask my athletes every day, I say, look at yourself in the mirror. And on a 0 to 10 scale, tell me how committed you are. And if it's below a 6, you probably shouldn't be a Division One athlete. If it's above a nine, you should probably see a shrink because you're a psycho. Um, no one's a 10. The only people that watch West Side versus the world, those dudes are 10s. You know, the rest of us are somewhere between six and nine. You know, Jay, honestly, you're more committed than I am in the sense that you're willing to do more research, do more studying than I am. I think we both know that. Um, that's why you will say words I still don't understand. But I think it, when people look at themselves in the mirror and say, how truly committed am I? That's a big moment. And if you can do that and be honest with yourself, I think you'll be a lot happier in life. Um, like I said, I just got to a point where I looked, I was like, you know what? I'm a solid six and a half, maybe a seven, but getting to an eight is things I don't want to do. And so uh, it gave me an opportunity to reassess my life, my family, uh, my, my son, my, my wife, and see what would make me happy in life. And, uh, and that's what made me step away from college strength and conditioning. That's heavy, dude, but I dig it. And I, I think that like, there's not a lot of people that I would hear that answer from and, and be like, yeah, you know, but that is, I mean, that, that really, I mean, cause we talked about some of this stuff in the past, like off camera and like, just, you know, candidly between each other. Like, I think that that, that internal reflection is something that it takes us to be put in a situation where there is some trying and there is some accessory stress to just what we're used to in the training environment. Um, and, and that's where you grow and figure out what's really important. You know, to me, it's like the, uh, you know, you made a great point. It's like the, the video of the lobster and, and, and growth in a lobster. Yeah, you know, uh, I forget how the video goes, but there's a video on YouTube. You search for lobster and stress. And when the lobster feels it's pushing against its shell, that's when it you know, drops a shell, crawls under a rock, builds a new shell. And the, the narrator says, the problem in our society is when you feel that pain, what do you do? You take Tylenol, you take ibuprofen. Um, it always goes back to one of my favorite things I stole from Ethan Reeves. Ethan said, man, I love a toothache. And I was like, what's wrong with you, Ethan? And he said, it lets me know I'm still alive. And when you have a toothache, you know you're alive. There's no question. You're not dead. Um, and so it, it, every time I go to the dentist, I think of Ethan Reeves. And uh, Sean Fantuzzi, who I know you've spoken to a lot, and a guy we both respect very much, he uh, he tweeted at me. He said, the dentist. He said, here I'm sitting at the dentist, and all I think about is Todd Hammer saying, God, I love the dentist. Reminds me I'm alive. I'm like, well, you know, Ethan paid it forward to me. I paid it to Sean. So we're all just passing stories along to each other. With all the amazing things that Ethan Reeve has done for this field, I'm sure that he's going to be elated that there's however many strength coaches now that are always going to think of him when he come, when they go to the dentist. I still text him when I go to the dentist. I still text him, Ethan, thanks for the reminder. I'm at the dentist, brother. My teeth are strong. I love it. I love it. Well, listen, let me get to your number two. You know, you're, as the Renaissance man, you ask a lot of questions. You dig into a lot of things, and you you don't take things for face face value. You actually like are a, are a learner. You're not one of those people that just talk about it. Like you are. You're a reader. You're a researcher. You know. You may say those things about like people using big words, but we step outside of the weight room, and all of a sudden we talk about things. And I'm just like, what? Um, <laughs> so this this one I, I actually am really excited about. 
if Todd Hammer could ask one question and he knows he would get the answer to it, what would that be and why? Uh, let me let me twist on his head a little bit. I heard a uh, an interview with a woman the other day who found out she had cancer and she had six months to live. And I, I forget the whole process of it, but the sticking point to me, she said, what's changed in my life? We all know we're going to die. That's just a fact. All they did with her is they told her when she's going to die. They gave her a date. Now, she actually overcame the cancer and, you know, overcame the odds. But her her point was that nothing in her life has changed except for someone actually told her when she's going to die. We all know. I mean, right now I'm sitting in a building. A beam could fall on my head. You're in the basement of Robin Center. You know, I mean, the floor could collapse and, you know, no more Jay and we'd all be sad. I'd come to your funeral, my man. But um, but we we don't know what tomorrow holds. All we know is we have today. So I'm going to throw it on his head and say – I. The beauty is the unknown. So while, yeah, I would want to know what the right decision is. I would want to know, should I take that job? I would want to know what tomorrow holds. In all honesty, I don't want to know. Not knowing is, to me, is where the beauty lies. Um, You think about strength conditioning. We've done it. Me and you have done it. We've complained. We've debated, argued over this is right, this is wrong. I've debated five percentage points with Brian Mann whether it should be 50% or 55. And at the end of the day, here's the truth. None of us actually know. Brian can have all the PhDs and all the smartness that he has and understand actin and myosin and troponin and all those things that, you know, I have to do spell check on. And the reality is we still don't know how we're going to react to any training stimulus. I work in a gym now that has 12 people competing Saturday probably have at least one person raw squat 900 Uh, a couple people probably be in the eights i'm talking raw squat um quite few lifters in the sevens um so we have a very strong group of individuals each of them trains differently and it's funny we were talking about one of our lifters last night and curtis our uh, director of personal training here said man if i could have taken him at 16 years old and i said he wouldn't have listened to you at 16 years old and that's his strength that his strength is the fact that he's just going to keep punching the barbell and he's going to punch the barbell. He's like, but technically he just cleaned up one little thing at 16. I said, but you might also hurt that other strength. So I don't think there is that one question out there that would give you this, uh, this Nirvana, this moment because of the fact that if you were to get the answer to that question, hopefully 10 new questions have arisen from it. And hopefully it has started a process where now you realize how truly clueless you are. And I know the adage is overdone, but, you know, the the older you get, the more you realize how little you know. And and at 43, I'm sitting here, I realize I honestly don't know much. I'm just muddling through it all and trying to learn a little more than I knew yesterday. So the answer to the question is, I don't want it answered. I don't. I want to keep fighting for it and hopefully one day figure it out so that once I do figure it out, it's it's open 10 more doors for me. I love it, man. That's if I had to guess, that's where I would have thought this was going to go is <laughs> you're, you're, you're like the 21st century Indiana Jones, man. You, you're more about the voyage and finding it than staring at it in the museum. Yeah, it, it's it, it, once I started having my athletes really get into meditating and doing it myself. I think that changed things for me with that too, because you appreciate the moment a little more. You appreciate that one rep. Um, One of the other bonuses I had is I was an older father. I had my son when I was older. And so I think because of that, I got to watch others be a father. And I'm like, man, I need to appreciate that one little moment. You know, whenever he says, dad, I'm going to wrestle. I'm like, Oh hell yeah, let's wrestle you know, appreciate that moment for what it is. And, you know, I'll probably never be the strength coach to run out at Alabama in front of a hundred thousand fans and hype up the team. Um, that's a cool moment. I have no doubt. Um, but again, as I look at the life and I'm saying to myself, what's my investment on my life? I can't say that, you know, giving up my Saturday and my Sunday is worth that, that moment. Um, maybe it is, maybe I'm wrong, but you know what? I'm just taking the, the best guess I got here. No, nah, dude, I dig it. So let me get you out of here with this ham for the last one. What's your escape, brother? Well, I already mentioned meditating, but my, uh, I have a few of them. Um, 
I play music. I've been playing music my whole life. If I, you know, if I can just sit down at a drum set, give me an hour and a half, two hours, I will escape, be in my own world. Um, one of the cool things about music, much like coaching, much like lifting, there are times I'll play something and someone will hear it on a recording and say, what did you do there? And I'll say, I don't know. You know, and you truly get into that flow moment where you don't know what you did, but you know it sounded cool. And then you have to listen and say, man, how did I do that? Because I was in that, I was so ingrained in that moment. I just, it was like you lose consciousness and you just go with the flow. And I think I've never been a great athlete, but probably similar to being a great athlete. When you see a basketball player, football player put a move and you said, what exactly was that move? And they go, I don't know. You know, I know I cut this way. I saw him go this way and I went, whoop, spin, flip, do whatever I did. You know, how often do we see a football player flip over a football player? Just because that's what he did. It's not like he walked up and said, ooh, I'm going to do a backflip over him. No, he just ran up and said, time to flip. And the body flipped intuitively. The body knew what to do. And I think it's a great lesson for strength coaches. Find that thing that puts you in that flow. So you know what it's like to be that athlete. You know what it's like to say, what did you do? I don't know, but man, it was awesome. Man, um, the other big one is cycling. I'm a big mountain biker. Try to get out two to three times a week. Uh, and the same thing, you know, there are times I look at like a technical downhill and go, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to get over it. And I think sometimes I might close my eyes and pray for the best. Um, and the days I don't end up in a tree, those are days I go, man, I did something right going down that hill. Don't know what it was, but something went right. Um, so I think, you know, finding that thing is important for mine. Probably number one's music. Um, Obviously, uh, I talked about right family, but but you know, when it's just me, it's it's probably gonna be the music. I love it, brother. Hey, I appreciate everything you're doing to make us better, and appreciate you being on today, homie.